Hello and welcome to our Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to see so many of you in the audience. I see a lot of our viewers are staying up late, perhaps from America. We also have some viewers from New Zealand, from Australia. Uh, so if you haven't yet, please let us know where you're joining us from today. We'd love to hear where you're tuning in from. We have a great session for you today. We'll be speaking about remembering the Anzacs, a look at both the Boer War and World War I in Australia and New Zealand. So a great session today and uh, hopefully relevant to all of you, whether you live in Australia and New Zealand or you have relatives or ancestors there. So a great topic. Um, I see Vivian says, wide awake in the city of Tampa. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Vivian. And uh, to everyone here in the audience, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, before we get to today's session, I'm just going to let you know about a promotion that we have going on here at MyHeritage. We are offering free birth records at MyHeritage, a special promotion that we have going on to celebrate spring and uh, new birth as we <laughs> move into warmer weather in, in some locations. I guess it's a little bit different down under. Um, but um, so celebrating uh, that, we are offering free birth records and that will be available until the 24th of April. So over 1 billion records that we are offering free access to search and to view those records. We'll be putting a link in the comment section so you can take a look at that. And we hope that you're able to take advantage of that over the next few days while that is still available. So please do take a look. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker today. We have with us Shauna Hicks, um, a returning speaker here at our Facebook Live shows and always a pleasure to have her here. She's been tracing her own family history since 1977 and she's worked in government, in, um, in Australian libraries and archives all over Australia. Since retiring from full-time work, she's written numerous family history guides. She's a well-known speaker at conferences, seminars, genealogy cruises, and of course here on our Facebook Lives. And um, you can check out her site at shaunahicks.com.au. And so without further ado, I'm going to be bringing her on the screen here to say hello to us. One moment. Let me bring her into the Oh, hello, Shauna. I see that I'm, I'm having a problem unmuting you. I, hmm, let's see. Let's see if we can get this <laughs> working over here. Um, let's try again. My, my okay, history. there okay. we go. I think, yes. I think we, <laughs> it wouldn't be a Facebook Live without a technical issue here. <laughs> oh, well, as long as we, we get past it, that's the main thing. <laughs> so welcome, Sean. It's so great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. We're really excited about this, and I know um, it's so important to bring this excellent content to our Australian and New Zealand viewers. Um, and uh, and that's why we love having Facebook Live sessions, especially geared for them and in their time zone. So, um, so we'd love to hear uh, what you have to speak about today. Um, I'm going to be looking at the military records within my heritage and how they relate to Australia and New Zealand. So as well as the Boer War and World War I, my heritage has a little bit about the Maori Wars in New Zealand and also um, a nominal role for World War II. So I, I thought I would top and tail and kind of do a whole of Australia military history, Australia and New Zealand military history in 45 minutes. So um, it'll be a whirlwind trip. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Do you want to share your slides now? Yes. Okay, you should now have my introductory slide up. 
Looks great. Okay. Okay. Well, as some of you may know, Anzac Day in Australia is the 25th of April. It celebrates a um, major World War I um, military battle at Gallipoli. And so this military talk is appropriate because April is very much a military type month in Australia and New Zealand. So I'm just going to be looking at the collections uh, within my heritage so that people are more familiar with the um, coverage for Oceania, which is where you find Australia and New Zealand. But before I get there, I just want to remind uh, listeners that you can access Australia newspapers through my heritage and newspapers are a great way to find out about what was happening during a war. You can often find photographs of soldiers when they come home. The three gentlemen on the right of your screens are the brothers Finn and they're my, my father's great uncles. And this is a really terrific photo for me to find in newspapers because it's of the three brothers all together. And I didn't have photos of any of them. So the newspaper was fantastic for that. And the other two photos that I've just put up there is to remind people to look for memorials because they will often list um, people who died or went to a particular war. And we also have to think, what was it like for the soldiers? Um, and I think that photo of the gas mask is so World War I, Western Front, um, being in the trenches and being gassed. It, it was, you know, not, not a great experience and it helps us to sort of understand what some of our ancestors might have gone through. So for me, photographs and newspapers tend to bring in some of that context and reality of wartime. So if we are looking for collections relating to Australia and New Zealand in my heritage, if you go to the collection catalogue, which can be found under the research um, menu on the far right, in Oceania, you will find Australia and New Zealand. There are categories for various kinds of records. And so with the military, you can see that there's seven collections. Now, these collections are mostly digitised books. And I'm talking about them because books are still relevant because they will mention ancestors' names. They give uh, histories of units. They, they explain what the war was like and they quite often will have diaries and letters and personal reminiscences. So I'm going to go through those seven collections um, in... Uh, chronological order and just to say a little bit about each of them and um, it'll help you to understand what kind of military um, records you'll find inside my heritage. So first we'll look at the New Zealand wars, the Maori campaigns. Now most of your listeners may be familiar with the little arrow that I've got there that expands in a collection detail. I think it's important to expand that and find out what is exactly in a collection before you throw in a person's name or a place or keywords. So the Maori campaigns were largely um, the British, British armies and soldiers fighting the Maori people mostly in the North Island of New Zealand between 1845 and 1864. And the records, the books describing these, um, this war and attacks and those sorts of things are written by the British and they're usually written 100, 150 odd years ago. So when you're reading them, you have to remember that they've been written in the time that was back then and not necessarily how we would talk about a topic today. So I still think they're useful because they do mention people's names and let you know really um, what the reality of the wars were like. So the first 
collection is the Maori campaigns in New Zealand. Now, most of these digitised books will have lots of um, photographs and maps, and these help you to picture what a particular battle or um, mm. battles were like. So this is the top end of North North Island of New Zealand and around the Bay of Plenty. Now, the little crosses in this map show um, many of the battles that took place up in that area of New Zealand. And it's important if you had someone who was a British soldier fighting the Maoris at this time, um, you may find their names in the books that um, have been digitised. So maps are very important. It helps to set the scene. Now, you can search um, the text because they're digitised books. You can put in a person's name, a unit, a place or whatever. In this particular instance, I used brown and edge comb um, because they were two soldiers that died in a particular battle. Um, now, they will talk about how the Maoris were killed and there's usually a lot more of them were killed than the British soldiers. Um, some of the descriptions of the fighting, um, it's quite graphic in places. So you may find that reading some of these descriptions um, can, can, be, um, can be graphic. But as I said, it was written so that people could understand it from a British point of view. And it's not necessarily how we talk about First Nations today. But it, given the ages of the books, you have to realise that's when it was written. But you will find um, examples of people's names through and a keyword search will bring it up. The next one is the Defenders of New Zealand and Maori History. And this is a short biography and it's sort of titled... Um, they see themselves as upholding Her Majesty's supremacy in these islands. So it's Queen Victoria on the throne and these British soldiers are defeating um, the Maori people. So it's written in that spirit. And, of course, if you do have a British soldier, I would then encourage you to read books written from the Maori perspective because that way you will see both sides of these battles. Now, the defenders of New Zealand and Maori history, I use the name Edgecombe again, and they came up two references to him. One is to his death and how that occurred, and the other leads you to a sort of nominal role of the soldiers who were part of the defence of New Zealand against the Maori First Nation people. So lots of names in these books, lots of names. Here's an example of the nominal role or nominal return there. You can see that it gives their name, their rank, their core and their date of death. Um, and it's in alphabetical order and it's between 1860 and 1870. And it is only the British people listed. None of the Maori were listed in that as well at all. So nominal return, lots of names. Now we'll move on to South Africa. This is the, um, the Boer War, as it's commonly called. And it was the first war that Australia and New Zealand actually got to send troops to and um, be involved and supportive of the British Army over in South Africa. Now, this is Murray's official history of the Boer War. Now, it was the only book available for a long, long time on the um, Australian and New Zealand contingents to the war. Since then, um, a number of projects have set up and have identified lots of um, people who Murray didn't include in the official history. So if you're not finding someone in this and the family story is that they did go to the Boer War, then I'd check some of the other sites now because um, Murray does have a lot of flaws, but when he wrote that in 1911, um, it was the definitive book. And 
right up until when I was um, started to research and into the 1980s and that this was still the only book to go to. Now, I put into Murray's history my mother's great uncle, Solomon Price, and he comes up twice. There's a listing in the Queensland contingent and there's a listing in the Australian contingent. Now, what happened between Queensland and Australia is that the colonies federated in 1901. So when he first went over to the Boer War, he was part of the Queensland Regiment. And when he went over the second time after 1901, he was part of the Australian contingent. So you need to sort of remember 1901 is a key key mark in Australian research because before that it's the colonies and after that it's the federated um, nation of Australia. So Solomon appeared twice in those two different regiments. This is um, him in the, um, he's from the uh, Northern District Regiment of Queensland, um, which was sort of like Townsville and West and up to the Cape kind of geographic area. So Solomon, he was a private. Now you can see there's a photograph of him. And that um, is typical. When the um, contingents were going overseas, some of the local newspapers took it upon themselves to take a photograph of every Queenslander going to the Boer War. And I'm not too sure how extensive it is for other states, but it also extended into World War I. And so you can get these snapshots of the soldiers going um, overseas. So that's what Solomon looked like. And as you can see, his name is Solomon with three O's. The records for the Boer War are in the National Archives and the Queensland State Archives because um, it's either side of that 1901 mark. But I'm going to show you the, um, the National Archives entry for him. You can see here that Solomon, which is third from the bottom, is spelt M-A-N. And that's how rigid the um, online archive catalogues are in Australia. They won't give you that as Solomon with an O. And I wondered why I couldn't find him because I knew he had to be there. And it is because it's been indexed as Solomon and not Solomon. And that I could get them to fix it, but then I'd lose that ex excellent example of why you're not finding something. You'll see that there's a digital copy icon for all of these. The Australian government has digitised all the Boer War files and all of World War I, and um, you can see them for free. So you could open up Solomon's file and have a look at some of those records. Now, if you look, you can see that it is definitely ON, and it's ON and ON, but whoever indexed it um, and put it online used M-A-N, and therefore you can't find it. But um, just be aware of those spelling variants. The documents themselves add a lot more to what you get from Murray's history. You can see that it tells you age, next of kin. You can find out height, colour of hair, eyes, um, what their chest is and what their chest is expanded. Um, there's all kinds of things in these files, and you can just download them for free. Now, the next record that also deals with the Boer War or the Transvaal War, as it's called in this publication, is only about Tasmania, okay? It's a Tasmanian publication um, commemorating those who went um, to South Africa and it was written in 1905. So again, it's 100 years old and it is in some ways glorifying um, war and it's not perhaps the way we would write things today but it does have people's names in it and it does give some interesting insights into what war was like. Now within this publication there are a number of diaries, 
personal letters and things like that. I've picked Chapter 7, Trooper H. Facey's Diary, and the publication gives a synopsis of what's in that particular chapter. And so you can sort of see they're complaining about mosquitoes, um, they're complaining about um, they haven't got good pants to wear, um, he's in hospital, he's sick, he's talking about the relief of Maeve King and the march to Bulawayo. Um, and I was intrigued by the all women must join their husbands. I thought, wow, what's that about? And then he shoots a donkey by mistake. You'll find that some of the language used is not what we use today, but you have to remember it was 100 years ago and that's what they used to write. So there's a lot in here and I was particularly interested in this because it mirrors Solomon Price's um, activities in the war and that's because the colonial um, troops all got rounded up together and were serving sort of together under the British. And so you'll have Tasmanians and Queenslanders um, together. And so I can see how Solomon would have um, fared in the war by reading Trooper Facey's diary. And this is just some examples that um, he's talking about um, getting to Maeve King, which was a major site. And he's saying telegraph lines are down, houses ruined, other evidence of having been some fierce encounters. They took 42 and a half hours to do the 490 miles. And it makes you remember that we don't, they didn't have the um, equipment and vehicles that we have today. And it's important to remember those sorts of things. When he's talking about putting up the tents, it's not little tents for each of them, it's a tent for, you know, half a dozen men all to be in there together. And so these are the sorts of things that help you to realise what it was like for them. And in this particular case, he's he's listed um, who's in his tent with him and then how they have a look around. They have no close access to water and it's things like that that made the whole whole sort of military exercise um, so much harder for, for both sides. Now, this is um, the bit about all women must join their husbands. And like in any war, there's always women and children that are left behind to protect their properties, to, to just stay in their houses and try and be safe. Um, because the men were away fighting, and that was true. And the British had a policy of um, keeping the women and children together and feeding them and looking after them because um, that was what they did. But after a proclamation by Lord Roberts, um, they all had to go and join their husbands, which was, of course, very difficult. Um, they were on the move all the time. And so from that point, the British no longer looked after women and children. Um, and if you read the description through, um, the, the two people who are on sort of sentry duty, going around checking on things, um, it almost sounds like, you know, they're having a social time. They, they go out, they have a cup of coffee at a Dutchman's house, then they halt at 7.45, they boil their billy and have breakfast, and then at 10 a.m. they off-saddled and had a sleep. Then they were roused by somebody and they got up and boiled the billy again and had dinner. They saddled up and went off about 3.30, stopped two miles and had another drink of coffee. Um, before they paid a visit to the women's lager. So um, that gives you, in some ways, the boredom of what war was like. One minute they could be fighting and, you know, they're about to be killed, and other times they're sort of, I don't know, just on patrol, just seeing, seeing what's happening out there. The other thing about most of these um, digitised books there is an index to illustrations. 
which is fantastic because you can browse through this and see the names of individuals and know that there's a photo of them and you can see what page it's on. And like all digitized books, it's not an exact match because sometimes the digital copy, um, there's blank pages and things like that that will expand um, the page out a little bit. But you can generally find what you're looking for. And so index to illustrations is really good and can be useful to browse as well. This is the first Tasmanian contingent on parade. So it was a photo that I thought was good because it shows the whole contingent um, probably before they left or when they arrived or something like that. Um, but yes, it's a good photo to have if you had an ancestor in that particular contingent. Now, moving, moving on to World War I, this is the New Zealand division. And it's written in 1921, which is 100 years ago um, this year. And it was written because the government wanted to provide an account for the general people. So when you're looking at these things, I would suggest you read the preface because that tells you the perspective in which the book was written. Um, because if you go to another history um, and if it's taken a more academic approach, um, it could be quite a different picture. So the preface will tell you that this is just a, a simple explanation of the New Zealand divisions in World War I. And again, it is comprised of soldier diaries, letters, dispatches, and those sorts of things that allow you to... Um, know what it was like to be with the soldier there. So in this particular example, they talk about snow falling in the first week of March, and that makes everything so much harder for them. But they're building a trench, they've got the wire, they've drained them, and they've made them defensible. They've managed to um, stop the enemy snipers. And then they go on to say, we've done all this great work, we've got everything done and it's all, all wonderful. And then they get moved on to the next post and they have to do everything all over again. And I think that was true every time either side advanced or retreated. They had to do all of this work. Um, so it's, it's, it, I think it's interesting to read the diaries. Now, the Anzac Memorial is um, written in 1919, and it's a comprehensive compilation of names, but it is written by the New South Wales branch of the Returned Sailors Imperial League. So it's New South Wales, okay? It doesn't have all of Australia. It has New South Wales. And that's why it's important to read the descriptions because if you look at that, simply Anzac Memorial, you might think, ah, oh, it's all of Australia and New Zealand, but you have to look at why it was written and who, writ it, who wrote it um, to know which part of the countries um, it's referring to. So this is New South Wales. The contents pages is another must read to get into these um, publications. Um, it tells you the... Um, different chapters, there's stories, verses, diaries, what it was like fighting in France and the Dardanelles, the Battle of Jutland, and, and so on through the book. Um, so contents can lead to, um, to specific parts, but I think in some ways it's almost useful to, to browse the whole book. And... What intrigued me in this particular publication was all the war memorials, um, Australian companies or New South Wales companies that sent so many of their men, um, then put up Roll of Honour boards at the end of the war, um, listing them and, of course, marking those who died and didn't come back. Um, and this is Singer Sewing Machine, you know, an Australian invention, I believe. And so that's the Roll of Honour. Um, for World War One, for Singer. And there's lots of photographs in here. And um, this is just 
um, a shot showing um, Australians in the trenches. And if you look around, there's no trees, there's no shrubs, there's there's nothing. This is just the wasteland of war. And they've dug this um, trench and, you know, you can almost see expressions on some of their faces. And they knew they were being photographed and yet you can still see um, that they're almost sort of happy and... and um, but yes, it could not have been great in those trenches. I, I lost several ancestors um, in the trenches. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat there. Now, uh, here's some Australians um, waiting to be sent off to the hospital. <coughs> You can see that there's the walking wounded, those that can get themselves there. There's people on stretchers. Um, and again, there's people turning around and wanting to be part of the photograph. So a great, great um, variety of photos at the back of this book. And of course, there's Roll of Honours, uh, A to Z, um, listing of all those New South Wales men um, and their patel battalions and um, units and a cause of death, um, whether killed in action or died of wounds and a date of death. <clears throat> um, here's Kitchen and Sons Limited from Sydney and Newcastle. They fought for God, King and Country and it's a listing of their employees who, who went off to war and again those that um, didn't come back are, are marked as such. So a lot of names in these publications. Now, one of mine that died um, on the Western Front was Frederick Travaskas. <clears throat> now, if you have someone who dies in the Western Front or World War I, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission is a website that is worth looking at. It... Um, is a simple search to find who you're after. It will give you a service number, their battalion, date of death, and what cemetery they're buried in, and he's in Belgium. Belgium, And you can also generate a certificate so that you can put that in the family history. Now, the certificate is on the left, and it basically summarises all of that information and it has a photograph of the Doshi Farm, New British Cemetery, um, where he has a headstone. And on the right, that's a photo of Frederick. It's the only photo I've got of him, and he's in army uniform, and um, he, he died over there. So it's a good, good way to, I don't know, commemorate his memory, um, because he never married, he didn't have children, and unless we commemorate those who died over there, um, they get lost, lost to history. Now, I can also get his army dossier from the National Archives. They're digitised and available to download. Now, this is the particular file, and there's 53 pages for Frederick Travaskas. So what is included in this is uh, information relating to his death and the contact with his mother, you know, he's missing, and then confirmation that, yeah, he's not missing, he's actually been killed in action and that sort of thing. So you get um, some family information in these files as well as what was happening to Trabascus over there. You get all of his movements in the battalion and all of that sort of thing. So 53 pages um, downloaded is um, a great record of his service. Now, if we have a look at World War II, the nominal role, 1939 to 1945, um, that is searchable within my heritage. And there's over 2 million records in this particular nominal role database. And it's for the Army, 
the Navy and the Air Force and the Merchant Navy. Okay, so you've got people possibly who are still living um, may come up in this database. So it's worth having a look. And I went looking for my mother's brother, uh, Gordon Leslie Price. And he comes up and his date of birth is given as 5 of December 1916. Well, that's not quite true. It's actually 1911. He was too old to go to World War II. He was too old. And so he lied about his age and made himself younger and he was accepted. So when you look at these dossiers, whether it's World War I or II, sometimes they put their age up so they could go and if they were too old, they put their age down. Okay, so you need to, need to be a bit flexible with dates because um, it depends what people were giving their date of birth for. Now, the photograph on the left is one that Gordon sent back to my mother um, during one of the Christmases. He was in the Middle East. He was um, in the Middle East first, and then he came back and finished the war in Papua New Guinea. And the photograph on the right is an Italian kidney dish. Now, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't Australian. I knew it wasn't Australian. So I approached someone at the Sydney War Memorial and I said, could they identify this? And they said it was an Italian kidney dish. It's what they used to um, eat their meals out of, which, you know, usually just some sort of stew type thing. And it's a lid and a container. And Gordon must have soup. Um, souvenired this at some point, possibly in North Africa, and he then carted that around with him to all the places that he went to, and he's engraved in it little drawings and his name and service number of the places he went to in the Middle East um, and in Papua New Guinea, and these little drawings. So it's quite unique because it's what they call um, souvenir um, war items and um, I've got it at the moment and I, I think it'll end up in the Australian War Memorial because um, there's no one in my family who would treasure this and because it is so unique and an example of um, soldier art um, during World War II, I, I think the Australian War Memorial is probably a better home for it. So you can build a story around finding your person in the nominal role. If you've got some photos and the basic details, you can do that. You can also have a look and see their um, dossier in the Australian archives, National Archives, and these will be digitised in the next few years and be free. But if you want to see one before then, you have to pay for it. And then once you've paid and got your copy, they will put it online for free. So the digital icon is there for Alexander Gordon Price, but the bottom one, which is my Gordon Price, it's not digitised yet. I actually have a photocopy of it because I got that in the days before digitisation. So the files are there and like the one for Frederick Chavascus, it gives all details of his service in the Middle East and then on into Papua New Guinea. It is a complete file of his service and right down to what they were paying him. So these files complement what you find in the nominal role. The other thing that you can do is go on to the Department of Veteran Affairs website and you can generate a certificate of their service. And again, this can be a nice, a nice thing to frame if you've got a photo of the soldier and you put that with this World War II service um, as a gift or something like that. Um, it gives um, those basic details. His next of kin was his mother, Alice, and it commemorates his wrong date of birth. It was never, ever corrected. But that um, certificate, again, is something that you can do for free from the Department of Veteran 
of his uh, website. All the URLs um, on this um, are hyperlinked, so you should be able to just go to those sites. This is um, another page from DVA's Nominal Roles. If you're interested in wars after World War II, um, they do have the nominal roles for the Korean War, Vietnam War, and the first Gulf War online. And you can search for them by individual name. So that's on the DVA site as well, if you're interested in more modern wars. Now, Gordon, Gordon Price, he was at the Siege of Tobruk. And if you have someone who's in one of these major, major battles, whether it's the Boer War, World War One, World War Two, you can go to something like Wikipedia and get a fairly concise history of what they went through in that particular siege and, you know, um, they weren't getting food in and they were running short of this and that and it went on like forever um it gives a more i don't know a more detailed view of what gordon actually went through and when he came back from the war he didn't marry until very late in life so he never had children and i i think he had i don't know the the war had an impact on him that perhaps he would have had a different life had he not gone to World War II. Now, a couple of other sites that I just want to mention that aren't linked into um, my heritage. The Australian War Memorial. This is a place where you can find all kinds of unit diaries, information on a person, uh, Red Cross, um, Red Cross files if someone was in a prisoner of war camp, those sorts of things. And you can get to it um, simply by putting in a person's name and their service number if you know it. And so it's fairly, fairly easy to use. That's the Australian War Memorial. In New Zealand, you have the Cenotaph and it um, also has a person search on it. Um, you can do that in English or Maori and um, you can just put their name in and go from there. And of course, there's other information on these websites. But if you're just looking for people, just start with a person search. So I just want to leave you with some last thoughts. The maps and photos add to the story. It, when you're talking about military history, it's often hard to picture what the war was like or or what it was like for those back home. And so maps and photos help to, to tell that story. And I think you need to read histories around some of those battles and, and from both sides. You know, in Gallipoli, you read the Turkish Turkish side and the British side. It, it helps you to understand what it was really like for those, those opposing forces. And the unit diaries, they can be incredibly detailed. Um, they can tell you what they ate for breakfast, you know. It's, it's an amazing detail that you're not likely to find elsewhere. And so these records in my heritage, um, they lead you on to these sorts of records. So definitely have a look. And um, this is probably true for other countries, not just Australia and New Zealand. Okay, so I will say thank you and stop sharing my slides and I'll come back for some questions. So I'm going to stop share and end. Thank you, Shana. And I'm back, yes. Yes. I am back, yes. <laughs> Um, yes, you're back. Thank you. Um, that was so informative and and so thorough. So thank you so much for that. Um, we received, first of all, if anyone has any questions for Shauna, please do put them in the comments section. I do see some nice uh, comments here. I'll read out just from Linda. She says, I was fortunate to find a handwritten letter from my second grade aunt in her son's World War I records. She was inquiring as to whom he named as beneficiary in his will. Luckily, he survived the war. <laughs> so that is a, um, 
and okay um, the national archives of australia i've got the setting sun in my face here at the moment um i'm just wrestling with the curtain um sorry um no problem. get rid of the sun um that's better um okay the national archives of australia has um a couple of series of records uh, relating to the um, soldiers who died and left wills. Okay, there's a couple of series there. They are indexed um, and they're findable if you go to the fact sheet on the military records. Um, you can generally go down and um, find these deceased soldiers' wills for World War I and World War II. I think from memory, the fact sheet is 136, but uh, don't quote me on that number. Um, but it is military records, and it does talk about the, the soldiers' wills if they didn't come back. Now, sometimes, too, they may be probated in an Australian or state Supreme Court, and it depends. I think you'll find most of the soldiers had to have a will when they went overseas. Um, but sometimes it, it's obvious they didn't, and you may find that if they did have property, um, it could have ended up in a state Supreme Court record or something like that. So I would certainly start with the National Archives. Okay. Um, let's see. I see uh, um, Linda says, a must-do task to check the diaries and digital books. You never know what you will find. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's the whole thing. I mean, when I looked at that Tasmanian um, book, I thought, well, there's nothing in it for me. But then when I started reading the diaries, it was the same battles that my, my people were at. And then you start to read and then they say, oh, the Queenslanders joined us last night. Well, then I think, well, my Solomon Price was part of that. And so he is then woven into that diary. And I learn a little bit more about what he's doing. So it can be surprising and it's definitely worth, I don't know, looking outside of the normal resources. And I think that's one of the reasons I like my heritage because You've got your usual suspects, but every time you ask me to dive into my heritage, I turn up things that I'm not expecting. And so it's good for my own research, but it's also good because I can then share these insights um, with all of your listeners as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, while we're on the topic about searching in unexpected places, I just want to remind everyone that we have actually a DNA sale going on here at MyHeritage for DNA Day. So excellent prices on DNA kits. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure you've tested most of your family, Shauna, correct? Sorry, they... I'm sure most of your family has had their DNA tested. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, um, it was a big surprise for me when I got my DNA tested because I found out that I wasn't Norwegian like I thought I was. Um, it turned out that Grandad wasn't Dad's father. It was the big family secret that nobody told me about. So I, I found DNA a little bit traumatic there at the beginning, um, but... I believe in the truth and I'm glad that I did find that out because it explained a whole lot of things that I didn't quite understand. And so I have granddad's family now, which is like dad's adopted family, and I have his biological family um, that I'm having fun tracking down. Um, it's given me a whole new family to look at. So, yes, DNA, it's one of those things that um, you have to make certain you want to to do it and be prepared for any surprises. Um, so, yeah, it was Dad's surprise, not mine, but, um, yeah, close to her. <laughs> um, so we'll put a link there in the comment section for anyone who wants to take advantage of our DNA Day sale. Uh, please do take a look. 
Um, so Shauna, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you coming on and teaching us more about Australia and New Zealand uh, history and, uh, and research methods using MyHeritage. It was just so useful. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank, thank you for having me. And I, I hope all your listeners um, learned something. Thank you. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this session will be available on our Facebook page under the videos section. So you can always rewatch it um, and go back and refer to it at any other time. Um, and you can also take a look at all of our other sessions, which are available there as well. Thank you again, Shana. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Good.